I'm Doug O'Keefe, and the uh, Fireside Chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum, which is hosting us tonight in the ATM Auditorium, so a big thank you and shout out to the Leather Archives. Also a big thank you to Slate Travis, who's our tech person and who's filming tonight. The Leather Archives strives through this program to capture the stories of the people who shape our community. Once in a while, an amazing opportunity comes along, and that's what's happening tonight. I have the privilege of interviewing someone that I call family in this community. Please welcome Leslie Anderson to the stage. And just so you know, as I said, we are filming, and it is on Facebook Live. We'll have a few minutes at the end for some questions. We don't normally film that, but just so you know. Okay? <laughs> And Leslie, yes. welcome. Ah. Ah. And welcome, Leslie. Is Thank you. Put this over here? Okay. I don't care. Are we feeding me? back still? It doesn't sound like it to me. Okay. Okay. So let's start right at the very beginning, Leslie. Where are you from? Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, about your family. Well, I am originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, my father's side of the family is all from Brooklyn, New York, and my mom's side of the family is from Northern Ontario, Canada. And when I was about six years old, my father packed us all up and we moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, like night and day from Ann Arbor, Michigan. But I pretty much grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Tell us a little, about, a little bit about the Albuquerque you knew. Albuquerque is like a moment frozen in time. It's, <laughs> yeah, uh, evolution has kind of left them out sometimes on things. But interestingly enough, when it comes to the gay community, they are very progressive. Why do you say that? Well, they're very out and outspoken, and maybe it has something to do with the culture in Albuquerque. It's got kind of that hometown, small town feel without too much of the, without too much of the, hello, without too much of the good old boys mentality, but that's still there sometimes too. I should think, is this all? I, I should think with Albuquerque that it would have a very uh, sort of a Southwest influence. How do you see that? Yeah, but it's also at the very end of Route 66. So it's connected to all of America in a way. And there's a lot of nostalgic cars, um, a lot of very down to earth people. And an excellent climate for leather. <laughs> but you told me when we prepared for this interview that your father had a major influence in your life. What did your father teach you? I think my dad had undiagnosed ADD. He had he had a genius IQ. Um, sometimes, though, he was, it's sporadic, isn't it? Um, sometimes he didn't have common sense of a flea. But let's just share this out, it might be better. Anyway. He didn't have the common sense sometimes. He would do things like, I walked home and forgot the car at work. 
you would think, you know, somebody with 160 IQ wouldn't do stuff like that. But he did it all the time. All the time. And he was held back a couple of years from school. And a perpetual student, in a way. So, you, you were saying sort of a, a perpetual student, but where did he excel? In what areas did he excel in teaching you things? He taught me patience and perseverance in a way, and attention to detail. Uh, my father could sculpt pretty much anything out of wood. He could construct anything. Uh, he was handy with all kinds of tools and artistry, and he had a very creative kind of eye for many things, and he encouraged all of that in me. And as it turns out, me having ADD also, uh, I learned to center myself and be able to hold on long enough to retain more things than he did. For example, I've never forgotten a car at work. <laughs> <laughs> you also mentioned, is it on? We're in so much sound system. Okay. You also mentioned that uh, your father taught you a lot of life skills. For example, what life skills did he teach you? I think basically my dad taught me not to be so impacted by other people. For lack of a better analogy, I'd say my dad really gave me the fundamentals of self-esteem. Um, as it turns out, that's a really good skill to have, <laughs> especially when you're an unusual teenager and you're awkward in any way, like most teenagers are. Um, he really looked beyond that in me. And he also would encourage some pretty bad behavior on my part at times. Uh, for example, he he said, I was getting bullied in gym class, and he said, uh, after my mom had said, you know, just turn the other way, and so on and so forth, my dad said, I'll give you a dollar for everyone that you just punch, right? <laughs> so I went to school that day and made five dollars in gym class, but I got suspended as well. <laughs> Well, you, you've spoken a lot about your, your father, but what have you say to uh, about your mother to tell us? We don't have a long enough program for my mom. <laughs> my mom was really, she was magnificent. She's kind of my hero in a lot of ways. She just recently passed away. I say recently, I think it was, it's three years ago now, but my mom was a survivor. She was a supreme survivor. She was, uh, when she was growing up, she was very severely physically abused. Um, and on my mother's side of the family, I come from a long line of addicts and alcoholics. I mean, some five-star you know, real winners. <laughs> in fact, my mom took me to a family graveyard up in Northern Ontario, a little suburb, I think it was Sudbury or Skeet. That's the name of the little village, yeah. But all of her family is buried in this thing. And one of her cousins was with us and kept pointing out, oh, there's Anne so-and-so, such a tragic thing about that accident on the stairwell. Oh, oh, there's Uncle so-and-so, you know, that thing with the liver, yeah, yeah. So come to find out you know, that they all, one way or another, died from alcoholism, basically, addiction. So I kind of had a precursor to that, but 
despite all of that, you kind of have to take the good and the bad with people. And my mom really had some winning qualities. And towards the very end of her life, she did stop drinking, miraculously enough. But uh, too late to save her from, you know, really severe diabetes and uh, heart problems and all kinds of things. But she did live into her 80s. So. Taking things on a slightly lighter note and maybe get a laugh in here, what do control top pantyhose and Brooklyn have in common? <laughs> This, this comes from my father, some family. Um, control top pantyhose and Brooklyn have flat bush. Can you imagine being a father and having your dad tell you that? And then you repeat the joke and your mom just does it. <laughs> yeah, she knew where that came from. My, my father's side of the family, if I can impersonate my aunt, my father's older sister, she's really a piece of work too. <clears throat> She'd say, John, come to the window. It's the gays and the heaven and the parade. <laughs> <laughs> well, occasionally when we hear you speak, I hear other people, there's a bit of a sort of a Texas twang in your accent. What can you tell us about that? I claim the fifth. Ah. <laughs> I, uh, in addition to having ADD, I had a speech impediment. I, I still have it. It's a stutter, a, a stammer. And um, so I went to a speech pathologist, and she was from the Panhandle, Texas. So I did get my stutter under control to some degree. And it's still a work in progress, but I also picked up just a, just a faint amount of her accent. <laughs> you uh, are actually the youngest certified diver ever from age 11. Tell us about that. When I was a little kid, I used to watch the undersea worlds of Jacques Cousteau, and it was on Sunday nights before the, you know, wonderful world of Disney and whatever other shows. Um, and I'd run with my little blue rocking chair, and I would sit plastered up against the television and watch this, and uh, I was just, just enraptured. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and you know, I proclaimed it from when I was four or five years old, and I never stopped. And so my father became acquainted with a master instructor with the Professional Association of Diving Instructors down in New Mexico, all the places you'd think landlocked New Mexico. But there's some good diving there. Um, and so this man said if she can pass all the uh, you know physical tests and, and do this, then then she can be certified. You know, it's not unheard of, but no one's ever done it before. And I was lo and behold, I was able to pass all the physical tests, but I was too small for any of the equipment. So everything had to be adapted just a little bit. So my dad was very adept at that. And uh, quickly I grew out of my wetsuits and stuff because, you know, puberty came on. Hello. <laughs> um, but yeah, I got certified when I was 11 years old and then went to uh, Mexico to the Sea of Cortez and did my first big ocean underwater dive with probably 200 hammerheads circling right over me. It was incredible. I was hooked. I was hooked. I'm still hooked. But what, what physical testing was required of you? Just swimming, holding your breath, not panicking. Um, I would 
so it, it has a lot more to do with feeling comfortable, not only in the water, but in your own skin, uh, uh, being assured. Because I could go through all of the exercises, whereas some of the adults would get really panicky. Uh, I just followed my dad's guidance when it comes to that. Stop, think, get control, go. So that's kind of my mantra for that. So I know you, uh, you've gone diving in various countries around the world. Tell us a little bit about that. One of them was South Africa, wasn't it? Yes. I, as I said, I was hooked on sharks. And I had a dream of going to South Africa to dive free of the cage dive in the cage, but also free of the cage with great white sharks. And uh, so it took a lot of work. And I looked and looked and finally found the right tracked expedition for me. And a couple of friends were doing work for Shark Week. And they loved my company. And so I basically was a shadow diver. Uh, or safety divers, they're called. You know, that just, uh, my basic duty was to perch myself on top of the shoulders of some of the camera people and uh, turn them in the proper direction if a shark was coming at us. Uh, and sometimes push the shark off, which I thought was just great. It was a party. Um, I really enjoyed it, and they, they got fancy ideas because we had uh, one guy who's doing prototypes for GoPro cameras said, I got an idea, Leslie. You know, you should always go the other direction when someone says that to you. He uh, basically hooked up a GoPro on my head. And they dropped me into a freaking bait ball of sharks and <laughs> sardines and all kinds of predators. And I was getting body bumped by animals that they, fascinatingly, they, nothing hurt me. I just kind of looked, everything just kind of grazed into me and over me. And it was like a, transcended state. It was almost in a meditative state. Um, really an incredible life experience, but yes. And those with great whites out of cage and a number of other sharks. And it was really, a, it was a well worth everything that I did. Wow. But coming back a little bit, uh, you were acted very early on, and your parents' closet was fascinating for you. Tell us about that early sexual exploration. What all went on there? Oh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, how much to say about this on Facebook Live? My parents have a lot of shoes and belts and whatnot, and when I was a kid, they had in our, in our house, they had a very large, organized cedar closet. And there was something about the smell of the leather and the cedar wood. It just really turned me on. <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably about as much as I should say. <laughs> when I was 10, 10 years old, I firmly recall indulging in what is basically autoerotic asphyxiation. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I knew I was really different that I got off really, and I hadn't gotten off, let's be honest, at all until that experience and then I realized, well, oh, this is quite a conundrum because this is the only way I can get off, period, is by this really intense, kinky 
stuff, but then I met other people that engaged in this sort of thing, and I, that's a whole different story. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe and it, when we're at Touche or something later, we can talk a little more about that. But one thing that came up when we were preparing for this interview that I found very, very funny was you used a pirate spear to force Little Bo Peep to strike. What was that? Well, this was one of those Halloweens when I was little. This was still in Michigan. Um, I dressed up as a pirate and had a plastic sacrum, you know, feeling really mighty with that. And my neighbor's daughter, uh, she was dressed up, as I recall, as Little Bo Peep, something like that. But I held Little Bo Peep up the throat with my saber and made her take her panties off. <laughs> she did. She knew what he was doing. She did, and then my father caught us. And he stuttered and stammered and said, You can't you can't do that. And I said, Listen, we don't no more of that and don't tell your mother. <laughs> Whatever happened to little Bo Peep though, what what became I don't know what happened to her. Foreign star or something. I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe she's a circuit judge on the court of appeals. I would like to think that little Bo Peep made it out of childhood. And chat too. But, but building on that a little bit, um, let's talk a bit about your coming out because it was very interesting. Did you even have a concept about homosexuality? You know, I, I guess this is the part where I should mention that I felt much more akin to men um, back then. It wasn't that I wasn't attracted to women. I was very attracted. I mean, little boy, who could exist? But my perceptions of lesbians uh, you know, women who were like this. Uh, it was it was very different in New Mexico. This was the eighties, um, and back then, when I was in elementary school, we knew the other gay kids, but nobody outed anybody, um, and we never were out about it because there was a real threat of having a shit pounded out of you, you know, at least the shit pounded out of you. Uh, it was it was truly scary, but we had like a little network of each other, and when senior proms or homecomings or whatever came, you know, we stepped up and went with our counterparts. <laughs> You know, and we always double dates and whatnot to these events. And by the time I got into college, there was a lot of uh, women's studies classes. And I began to notice that there was, there was factions of women. Um, and there were what I would call lesbians. And there were dykes. And um, the way I defined that in my own mind was a a dyke was more like me. We were we were more sexual, and a lesbian was political, almost tri strictly political. And also, lesbians tended not to like men at all. Yeah, so obviously I couldn't align myself with that. Plus, there was the kink factor. So it was really kind of a struggle to find exactly where you belonged. I imagine it's still like that for people. Uh, but that's where my perceptions of actions start. Where do you feel you fit in that? 
But I'd say I'm a leather dyke. Um, I would say that I'm probably masculine uh, on the non-binary levels. Um, and again, that wasn't even something that we could hold on to. There weren't those options. I know they're not options, but you know what I mean. When you were aligning yourself with other people or making other friends, you couldn't really define things like that. Um, if you were too butch, you were going to get trouble. Everyone knew. Um, and plus, there is always the stereotypical badgering that I had to endure. I got very large female penthouse centerfold breasts, <laughs> you know? And people would say things, even family, well-intentioned family would say to me all the time, God, that just, that isn't fair, you know? That, that the dyke got those breasts. Why didn't I get those breasts? It's like, what do you think? That other women don't like this too? I mean, <laughs> wow. You, you would sure be a beautiful woman if you would just, you know, accentuate your your features, your feminine features and stuff. There's always that nauseating kind of thing. But I just put it off, but it does damage, you know, over years and years and years. Yeah. And uh, we're all just kind of fighting back to pull out of that. You, you mentioned things that other family members said, but you also told me your parents really rose to this occasion. Tell us about that. At first they did not uh, I think the hardest thing for my mom ever to accept was the concept of non-monogamy. She just couldn't do that. You know, she was raised Roman Catholic and all, but she tried. Um, both of my parents, after they got over the initial shock, both of my parents really got involved and participated in everything around gay, lesbian experience, um, and they were very supportive. Um, in her 70s, my mom was, I'm sure, the only woman who knew the hanky code. <laughs> you know, she had particular colors that she would say, no, brown in this house, no. <laughs> decimated our soul. 
And my mom said, look, I've been around with tuberculosis and this and that smallpox. I'm not letting any little AIDS, you know, stop me from doing this. And my God. And she was a role model for so many of us. Just, you know, you can learn a lot from people who are fearless. You just pay attention. Yeah, yeah. But you also said that your college years were a very formative time for you. Tell us about that. My father passed away in 1985 when I was in my undergraduate studies, and I fell apart. I mean, I just, I really indulged my drugs. I am recovering now for, um, this October will be 29 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back then I just, I felt a whole loss of purpose and I just didn't care. I literally didn't care what I put into my body or what I did. I did everything by feel, um, which is both good and bad components to it when it comes to somebody who's in their early 20s, you know. Um, but I started to attend certain classes and got involved in some groups. And yeah, I went to the bar scene and I started to see you know, drag queens and rodeo guys and leatherman. So that opened doors. You, you spoke very beautifully about the Leatherman you met in your journey. Tell us more about that. Well, as I said earlier, I was very aligned with the men. And I immediately sought out men, not coincidentally, who were father like figures, so daddies. <laughs> Um, and a gentleman by the name of Gil Blocka, who passed away from AIDS in 95, but he basically was a daddy to many people in the community, and he treated me just like all of his family members, all of his cis men, uh, family members. Um, but I, he didn't make exceptions for my being female body. He made exceptions for the fact that he saw me as a dominant, which was extraordinary. I mean, to be seen by somebody that you admire and you respect, um, and then everyone else in the family looked at me that way too. Uh, to be seen, I don't know if you, everyone experiences that differently, but it is so self-affirming. Yeah. I think it's so critical for people to have that self-affirmation, wherever it comes from. Um, it's, it builds you up. It builds up the foundation of who you will become. You know, that's what it did for me. Um, one person that was very critical to me was a professional female impersonator by the name of C.J. Diamond. Uh, his real name was Chris Herrera. He died of AIDS in 96. In fact, most of the people that I have known and love and who I call family are dead from AIDS. So, um, and all within a certain period of time, within I would say five years, I probably lost a hundred men that I was very close to, and a couple of women too. Um, 
CJ was incredible. I would say CJ was the first man that I've ever been in love with. I really fell in love with CJ. And I had the best of both worlds because he was something else, you know? He was a professional female impersonator. He taught me some strange things that, interestingly enough, I use at IML. He taught me stagecraft, uh, a lot about lighting and dynamics and how you move on stage and, you know, what's visible and presenting your body in certain ways uh, that are very subliminal messages to an audience. And uh, I find that that was really invaluable, but you know, he passed away in 96, and uh, I would say he had the most horrific death oh. from AIDS that I've ever witnessed. I'm so sorry. And uh, you still miss him. I can't help but ask, you said he, he taught a lot of stage presence. Or give us an example of something in that arena that he taught you. Well, he taught me some things about makeup and your facial expressions. Uh, you know, what you can do with an audience by looking into the light versus looking into someone's eyes. They cannot see you looking into their eyes from a stage dynamic, but they can see you looking into the light. So, he would tell me to make a pyramid as I walked out onto a stage and to find target lights that I would stop and align my, my look at those lights. And if you look at people who are very, very good um, and have a stage presence, they work a stage in that same kind of a manner. Um, and they find target points, whether it be people or a light or whatever it is. And then you incorporate your words to go with that message as well. Well, tell us about your first forays into boot blacking. Well, that started in my childhood. My mom was a nurse, as I've said, and she worked the graveyard shift emergency room, labor and delivery, all of the fun stuff. And back then, nurses wore white shoes. They wore one of those silly white hats and all that bit. <laughs> well, she did. And I was a little kid, but my dad let me stay up late every night, and I would shine up my mom's white shoes. Um, and I would leave them out for her, you know, the best part of my day, every day, was having my mom put on those white shoes and looking approvingly at me, and then I could go to sleep on that. Because I really missed my mom when I was growing up. I never saw her. I, I had missed her mom for my dad, um, but I really, yearned to be around my mother, and that was just the best feeling. Wow, that's very strong. But you also said when we prepared for this that true boot lighting comes from the heart. Explain that. Well, I believe that you can, you can teach anybody some basic skill type things. Um, it's like giving somebody the ingredients and a recipe to making something. And most people can follow those instructions and do an okay job. But that's just maybe shining your shoes. Boot blacking is something that you either have a boot black heart or you don't. That's that's my feeling on that. And what that's based on is more, more than anything else, 
It's a willingness or a, a desire to serve. To serve something from your heart to another person's heart. It's a gift that only you can give. And this is how you make it look. And see, it even makes me smile just thinking about that. It gives me goosebumps. <laughs> it's it's the willingness to serve. What is the greatest lesson you learned in this journey? Well, I had a, I had a great mentor, um, Herbie Blackhill. His name was Hank Mearsbo. Uh, Again, he died of AIDS in 96. He was a professional rodeo uh, bull rider. Um, he walked with, you know, <laughs> cowboy swagger. And he had a big handlebar mustache, and you couldn't understand the damn thing he said. <laughs> <laughs> he had such a thick Oklahoma accent, <laughs> and he chewed tobacco, so. It, if I might impersonate Hank just a little bit, he'd say, if I didn't know that you wanted to go, then I'd have seen that you got to get to go. What in the hell? If I had known that you wanted to go, then I'd have seen to it that you got to go. <laughs> and then, you know, the, that was good. But, yeah. Almost everything he said, if he said something at all, it was either really important, and if it was really important, it was guaranteed unintelligible. <laughs> but he taught me, probably the best thing that he taught me was uh, to know my worth. He didn't allow me for a year and a half to charge anything for my bootlegging services, which made me angry and frustrated with him a lot of the time. But he wanted me to really feel valuable. I have so much to give. Look at all this work that I put into it. Yes, now you get it. <laughs> <laughs> and That, as it turns out, is an incredible lesson, not just for book class, but for everyone. If you don't know your worth, you will be subjected to the assignment of what everyone else thinks you're worth. Yeah. You may not like that. Mm -hmm. So, you need to know this. You need to feel that. The other thing that he taught me about Boot lagging and about life was to become a conduit and never a vessel. But what the hell does that mean, Leslie? Well, I'm an energy player with my hands. In fact, everything that I do is, is really comes from my hands, my heart, my hands. And I would feel drained and being somewhat empathic in a lot of ways, I wound up feeling really drained um, from boot blacking. And I didn't like it. So he would impart on me to become a conduit. In other words, allow the energy, whatever it is, to move through you, but don't keep it. Don't ever keep it. It's bad, move it through. It's good, move it through. It makes no difference, move it through. By the end of it, all you've done is you've sucked a few of the nutrients out <laughs> yeah. and you've moved it on to somebody else or you put it somewhere else. But as it turns out, that's something that I've uh, used very successfully at IML as well. <laughs> wow. Well, I know that a lot of people here and a lot of viewers worldwide will want to know, where did you acquire 
a lot of your skills that you bring to bootlocking. I honestly am kind of self-taught. Uh, because there was no boot black in school, even though I apprenticed for a long time to Hank. I also apprenticed to a saddle maker in Peralta, New Mexico, for a while, uh, which was interesting. I learned a lot of the nature of leather, but I think it, it, it's mostly self-taught. Um, Again, since boot blacking comes from inside and you either have that within you or you don't, I channeled myself in the right places at the right time. And I studied shoeshine boots at airports and bus stations. Wow. I would sit for long periods of time, sometimes getting my boots shined, sometimes not. And you know, I would write notes. I don't know if anyone's seen my notebooks, but I, my notebooks look like Unabomber's notebooks. <laughs> I little pictures and drawings, you know, frantic writing and stuff. That's, you know, that's just what I do. But I couldn't get enough of this information. And I made lots and lots and lots of notes. Not just about their shoe shining skills and products, but mostly about their stories. Wow. You know, they would start to tell me their story. I think a lot of successful boot blacks are storytellers. Wow. Um, or therapists or both. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what is your fundamental philosophy about boot blacking? Just that it's um, a premium gift. It's serving a greater good, something that's bigger than you are, but you're a part of. Um, for me, it's just an extraordinary gift that I, I feel like God. Um, I can never get enough of it. If you know me, you know, I pretty much boot black every day. Not just here at work, but at home. I mean, I'm always piddling around with some piece of leather or something or other. And even if people want to bring, even during the pandemic, I don't know how we managed it, but my God, the way Connected with somebody, and we got like 200 pairs of boots. It was so it was just a scene. My whole house, oh my god. But yeah, I, you, you feel compelled. You're drawn to do it. Um, no, I can do better. I can shine that more. It's almost competitive. It's just, it's like heroin, but it's, it's good. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> well, for 17 years, I've worked with you at IML. We started at the same time. And we are both contestant handlers. You started a tradition during this work that you've been doing. You take care of all the boots, all the leathers at IML. But what you do is breathtaking because you touch every metal and you've touched every pair of boots. Tell us about that. Well, I'm not gonna reveal some of the secrets, so <laughs> you boot blacks in the audience, put away your notebooks. <clears throat> You're not getting it. Um, it's, I practice at IML be conduit and not vessel. I noticed very early on at IML that if you had a couple of people in the class of contestants who were viewed by everyone else as leaders or 
you know, maybe somebody that had a good chance of winning or whatever it was, that if that person happened to have any negative energy, that it was contagious throughout the entire group. And it would be toxic. You know, you got 60 guys all crying and whining about and <laughs> no, seriously. Ugh. But they oh, and they do. oh no. I quickly figured that the best way to channel that was to channel that and like move it not just through me, use myself as the conduit, but move it through them, move it through them, move it through them. So I would start with somebody who was positive no matter who that was. And I can always find somebody that's got that real bright energy. And I picked up some of them <laughs> and I moved on. And the best place to touch that contestant and uh, to make them feel like I was communicating with them was to touch their medals. Yeah. Most of their medals are hanging over their hearts. So, and now I even do it two-handed. Bam! I'm doing a couple at a time. Well, it takes that amount of time to get through all those contestants and move their energy. So again, I would just open up as myself, taking on whatever it was that they had. If it was bad energy, no problem. I'm gonna channel that through me. I'm gonna dump it off. In the meantime, I'm going to give them a little punch of positive. And I noticed that when I would take my hand away, they would pick their heads up and open their eyes and they would smile and they were glowing. I'm like, look, it works. <laughs> and so that's, that is basically what I do. Um, I found that it's just instrumental in how the contestants operate not just for themselves, but as a group, how close they become. So. Building on that a little bit, I always call you the community's common denominator. And in that, what I mean is, no matter what's going on in the community, or who won't speak to whom, everyone speaks to Leslie. Everyone includes Leslie. And I've never met anybody who hasn't thought very well of you. So, tell us about that. Why, <laughs> why is that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm lying. <laughs> you believe me that there are people that don't like me. But you know what? They're jealous or something. It's their business. If somebody doesn't like me, it's really none of my business. Um, I think the vast majority of people who really know me at least put up with me. They may not love having me in their company, but they like me enough. And I think I, I saw some interview program with Penelope Cruz. I know. Uh, <laughs> she's hot for <laughs> Penelope Cruz was saying about people who are detractors or, you know, talking shit about her. She says, if someone runs up to you and they're just, just berating you, but it's in a different language and you don't understand it. You don't feel anything by that. You don't feel anything. You know why you don't feel anything by that? Because we assign meaning to the words that somebody else spews at us. We assign the meaning, both good and bad. So when it's 
When someone's saying something really bad, consider the source. That's true. They're not your, they don't know you, or you've barely seen them, or God forbid, they're online and saying shit on Facebook to you. <laughs> well, who the hell cares? Really? I mean, their opinion shouldn't mean anything, especially if it's to attack you. So, I guess it's really good self-esteem, but that that's how I am. You know? So when people tell me things, even insofar as saying nasty things about somebody else, I'm still considering the source. They've got motivation that's none of my business. And I think human beings are, you know, kind of a package deal. There's always going to be good and there's always going to be bad. And so you can take what you want and leave the rest aside. Yeah. Building on that a little bit, I've seen you take some extraordinary steps in the community. When someone's been in trouble or someone is in a bad spot, I've seen you rise to occasions you never say anything. You don't tell people you've done it. You just very quietly take care of them. What's your motivation there? It wasn't on the program. <laughs> <laughs> well, the things that motivate me are my ability to empathize with people and a lot of times I'll go and help somebody uh, who, I, who seems to really need it and the reason I don't talk about it is because that person deserves privacy and pride. They're embarrassed. I'm embarrassed when I'm broke and I need, <laughs> yeah, you know, I try to get over it. You, everybody finds themselves in these circumstances. Anybody. I don't care who you are. You can find yourself in a bad set of circumstances and need somebody. And nobody deserves to be humiliated over that or, you know, Everyone deserves a chance at redemption. For the grace of God, go on high, right? You know, the things that I did when I was in my addiction were ugly, they were horrible. And when I look at somebody else who's really in trouble, I see that person. What if everyone had given up on me and turned me out? I wouldn't be here. So, Try to keep my eyes open and my heart open. But let me tell you something. If you if you really push my buttons and it takes a long time, I am very patient and very kind. But if you fuck me up, you ain't never gonna get my look again. I will shut down so hard. And that's very human of me to even say that, but that's, that's the truth. I mean, everyone has their limits. Um, you know, I'm always trying to exercise the best caution in getting there, too. On a little bit of a lighter note, tell us about your work here at the Leather Archives. Well, this has been an extraordinary thing here. I've actually been involved with LANM since uh, the year 2000. But over the past uh, three years, I've been employed here on a part-time basis. Um, and it took me about three or four years of literally campaigning to the board to get them to hire me. Uh, 
So it's been like this magical mystery tour in <laughs> um, And I've kind of invented the wheel as I've gone along here, rolled along inventing the wheel. Um, but I believe that my mission here has been really positive and my work, I, I think longevity wise, that it's going to be one of the best things that's ever happened at L.A.M. Wow. And wow. I hope that people in the future see that too. I hope people feel inspired by what I've found, what I've worked on, and what I present to them. I hope that people learn something from people who have gone before. And I hope that us older generation people are far more welcoming and open-hearted to the next generation. Because they're the future. Yeah. You know, they have every right and they've got valid things to say, just like us. You know, that's what I want to do. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your amazing artwork. Well, yeah, that got started. Um, I was working on some leather um, artifacts and vests and boots and stuff for our friend Chuck Windeman passed away a number of years ago. And my phone rang and I had black shoe polish all over my hands. So before picking up my phone, I smeared it on the paper. When I answered the phone, I looked down at that and I thought, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it just took off. It's just, it just took off. I had paper on my wall. And uh, I put shoe polish all over my hands and I start drawing a bit. I just shake everything. In fact, on my artwork, you can always see my fingerprints <laughs> in the shoe polish. So, what advice can you offer someone new who's trying to get into boot life? If you feel it, don't let anybody tell you you're a bad fit for it, or you don't know what you're doing. Don't let anyone persuade you to depart from something that you feel. And that goes not just for boot blacks, that goes for kink, your gender identity, your sexuality, your taste in music and art, what you do with your free time, fuck other people who, don't, who try to take you away from that. Fuck that. Any day now we're going to hear, we're going to hear about Roe versus Wade being overturned. I, I never thought in my lifetime. And I hear younger generation people say all the time, how they don't want to be these rebels, these, these, you know. They don't want to be anarchists. They don't want to be leading the pack of protests and doing socially right thing to do. And they don't want to be powerhouses for equal rights and so on. Well, my words for you are get up and do it. You might get arrested. Hey, been there, done that. You know? And I'll do it again. I don't have a damn thing to lose. I don't care. But it's up to you. You want to be that person? Do it. Don't let anybody tell you no. Don't let anybody assign your value to you. You do it. What is the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> that I'm all sweet and nice and <laughs> <like that. laughs> yeah. I am very 
very sweet. I am very nice, and I am extremely kind until I'm not. And when it comes to important things, I can be downright vicious. Remember that five dollars that my dad gave me? Come to that girl. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie Anderson, I would like to thank you for an amazing interview for Inside Leather History of Fireside Chats. Thank you. Does anybody have a quick question? If I don't knock the chair over. Yes. Uh, I'll just come up and bring the mic over. Hi, Leslie. Uh, long time listener, first time calling. Um, I would love to hear, it's not so much a question, but more about your gender identity. I think you talked earlier about how you feel more non binary. Um, how did you come to terms with that? And is there anything else you'd like to say there? Um, obviously, it's a little preferential on my part. As someone who's also not married. <laughs> Good one. Well, remember what I said about people are a combination of good things and bad things. And I don't know. I, I believe partly by my genetics, I was born into, uh, or, you know, went through puberty into a let's face it, a very feminine body, uh, for the most part. Um, and it's hard to love yourself if you don't love all of the parts of yourself. So for me, it was kind of a journey of, of loving and feeling sexual about all kinds of, of facets of my personality, not, not just breasts, obviously, or not just genitalia, but um, my hands, my eyes, my everything, my heart. Um, and so not having to be pigeonholed, you know, into this one mold or that mold, it just, it's liberating to feel like I can be non-binary and I'm, I'm still s sexual, you know? Um, and I like me like this. It just, finding the self-love is really a profound journey. I think we are all taking it and we're all a work in progress. Things that always change for us. And I find out things about me that I didn't know all the time. <coughs> you know, I incorporate them and I embrace them like, welcome in. <laughs> you know, yeah, everybody got to get along here. Um, so it, it's kind of a lifelong journey. And I'm, I'm really glad that. We don't have to be held into certain categories and terms and molds. I like that. Anybody else have a quick question? Yes. yes. Uh, don't worry, mate. <laughs> 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 Why did you leave? The revealing question. Well, okay, I can go. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I don't remember you mentioning is about the menagerie you have. Oh, I think you and could yes. Good. Yeah. Well, it's no great mystery. I'm an animal lover. I like animals more than I like people. And here's why. Animals, if they don't like you, they don't like you. And they show that. <laughs> they don't trust you. They do not trust you. And they show you that too. Humans might show you something else. Be thinking. 
a different thing. Um, so I, I feel a certain level of just harmony and comfort with any animal, lots of animals. They also, animals say things with their body language that people can learn a lot from about how they, how they process things. And I have been living with all kinds of crazy animals all my life. My mom, oh my mom, that's another story. She animal lover, big time. My mother had a way with animals that were even dangerous kinds of animals. And my father did property assessment for the government and crazy things like that. And he would take me out to bear in mind this is in New Mexico. And there's rattlesnakes there. That's, that's their home, right? And my dad would just say, you say to yourself, I will do no harm. <laughs> just keep meditating on that. And then you take a stick, and remember, you poke with the stick, and then you take a step. Not the other way around. So you go around, then take a step, and then go around, and sure enough. <laughs> and he'd say, okay, stop. And we would gently move Mr. Snakey into a trash can, and then just place him in a nice place afterwards, and we had collected several snakes. And I never felt threatened because my approach was just, it will do no harm. And I just, it's not that I don't think rattlesnakes or break my trunks are not dangerous. Of course I am. You know? But it just, there's a different level of understanding in me. Not sure what all of that is supposed to mean, but stay tuned. <laughs> one more question. We've got time for one more. Somebody has? No more? Oh, last one. What happened to little old Peach's panties? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking know. would. <laughs> I don't know. Why? Did you, did you know them or you're going to donate them here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember they were white and they had like floofy tops, <laughs> ripples and stuff. And I was like, what the hell is that? Why? Take them off. No. I really don't know. I don't even know to this day if my father went next door to the neighbor and told them what happened to me. Because later on, I did engage in some perverse kind of things with the older brother of the boat people. His name was Bruce. Oh my God. And it involved pee pee. And I'm done. Yeah. Um, my dad did not catch us doing that. <laughs> so we did it again and then again. That's gone. That was good. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for the love of our